Ruchum Aboim. Again, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. And uh, it's been a little while. So uh, again, we were, before the holidays, we were dealing with, again, the the Amida, the Shemona Esrei. And uh, we'll continue with that theme. Again, we're up to, this is uh, election number, um, lecture number 11. Again, we're dealing with the, we'll see again, we'll talk as we get into this. So this week on My Thoughts, we will continue our in-depth discussion of the Amida. Again, which is also known as the Shmon Esrei, uh, with the tenth blessing in the prayer. This is also the seventh of the personal requests that we offer to God Almighty daily, with the exception of the Shabbat and the Yom Tovim. In this prayer, uh, we request of God our Father in Heaven to sound the great shofar for our freedom. Uh, this prayer is one of the six prayers in the Amidah that we offer to our Father in Heaven where we request that He should bring the Messiah. Now, this request follows the prayer where we beseech God Almighty to bless the land of Israel with its bounty. Then from the, that blessing, the whole world receives its sustenance. The Talmud in the Tractate of Megillah states that it is inconceivable that the land of Israel should give forth its bounty unless the children of Israel return and reside on her soil. This is based on the property of Yechezkel, who said, You mountains of Israel, sprout forth your branches and give forth your fruit to my people Israel, for they are close to returning. Rabbi Abba taught in the Talmud in the Tractate of Sanhedrin that there is no more obvious sign of the final redemption than the flowering of Israel's hills. Now, if the land of Israel ceases her mourning, it is because her children are returning home. Uh, look at the modern state of Israel today. You know, before the Jews returned to the land, it was a wasteland with only 150 Bedouins that were living there. No other nation, no other nation has ever been able to make the land bloom except for the true settlers of the land, the children of Israel. Now, this is the tenth blessing in the Amida. We know that the second temple was destroyed because of a lack of unity. In fact, the Hebrew letter Yud, which has a gematria, a numerical value of ten, is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. This alludes to humility. Humble, humility leads to unity, and unity leads to redemption. Our sages tell us that the Divine Presence rests on a quorum, a minimum of 10 men, what we call a minyan. This number was not chosen at random, since anything less than the number 10 is not considered to be a whole, whereas the number 10 is viewed as a complete number. The Rambam, Maimonides, writes in Hilchus Beis Abkhira that the holiness of the land of Israel surpasses that of all other places in the world. And in the land of Israel itself, there are ten levels of sanctity. Again, this is based on a Mishnah in Kalim. Uh, what is the meaning of Tekaba Shofar, a great Shofar? This too is connected with the number ten. <clears throat> the tenth and last tenth test, pardon me, that Abram Avinu, Abraham our father, was given was the Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac. Every morning as we begin our morning prayers, we recite this story. God Almighty made a request to Abraham our father that he should bring his beloved son Yitzchak up on an altar as a sacrifice to him. Both father and son willingly followed God's request, not command, request. Avramavino had made it his life mission to convince the world that it was a sin for a parent to sacrifice their child to an idol. Now, well, guess what? He was doing exactly that. Yet neither he nor Yitzchak hesitated in following God's request, even though it would cost Yitzchak his life and Avram Avinu his reputation. In the end, Avram did not sacrifice his son Yitzchak. God Almighty supplied a ram that was brought up as a sacrifice in lieu of Yitzchak. The horns of this special ram would play a major part in Jewish history. The left horn was blown at, blown at Mount Sinai when the Jewish children Children of Israel received the Torah directly from God Almighty himself. And the larger right horn, the great horn, 
will be blown to herald in the coming of the Messiah. Again, may he come quickly and in our time, based on the Pirkei Rebbe Lezer. The prophet Yeshayah foretold in the book of Isaiah that it shall come to pass on that day that a great shofar shall be sounded and they shall return, those who were lost in the land of Ashur and the outcasts in the land of Egypt. And they shall bow down to Hashem on his holy mountain in the city of Jerusalem. Now the sounding of the shofar prior to the coming of the Messiah conforms with the Rambam's principle. The Torah guarantees that the Jewish people are destined to return to God at the end of the exile period and, and that their repentance will lead to an immediate redemption. As we read in the portion of Nitzavim, where God Almighty states that he will have compassion on you and will return and gather you from the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. Now the prayer continues with the sun hates the Kabbis Kali of Sainu and raise the banner to gather our exiles. Now for those righteous individuals, the sound of the shofar being blown will be enough to return them to the land. However, for those individuals who have become entrenched in the nations in which they are exiled, God Almighty will bring a great nace, which means miracle, visible evidence that the time of the Messiah has come in its, as it states in the book of Isaiah. And it says there, it shall come to pass on that day that God will stretch out his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people that shall be left over from Asher and from Egypt. Now the Hebrew word nase also means a mast or, or a banner. The verse in the book of Isaiah continues and states that he shall raise a banner for the nations and he shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The Mechilta comments on the verse in the portion of Vayera which states that ain't Shmia Korea, that hearing something cannot be compared to seeing something. The sound of the shofar will be for all to hear, Jew and Gentile, believers and non-believers alike. This can be compared to the shofar that was blown in the land of Israel on the 50th year, the Yelovo, the Jubilee year, which freed both the Jewish slave and the land simultaneously. So too the blowing of the great chauffeur will signal to all of the inhabitants of the world that the coming of the final redemption is imminent. The Munkacher Rebbe, Rav Chaim Elazar Shapiro, using the translation of a nace, a miracle, stated that the Jewish people will return permanently to his land only through overt divine action, which we pray for and await with patient faith. Now the prayer continues. Um, and you should gather us together from all the four corners of the earth. And this phrase ends with the words, the Artsenu, to our land. Three times a day, six days of the week, we recite that the land of Israel is Artsenu, our land. Nothing has changed. Again, this was done by the men of the Great Assembly at the beginning of the Second Temple era when they put it in. Now, and it's very strange that after the destruction of the Second Temple, God Almighty orchestrated that we should be exiled to Arba Kampus or to the four corners of the earth. Now, if his intent was for us to become more righteous, well, separating us to all four corners of the earth does not seem like a logical strategy. If we were not serving God and observing his Torah properly while we were all together in the land of Israel, then why would we do so when we are scattered amongst the nations? So there are different answers to this question. First and foremost, it was a factor that contributed to our survival in the exile as a people, much like the story of the Holocaust, that even though Euro European Jewry were being persecuted and wiped out by the Nazis, Jews and other parts of the world were actually safe. This was true throughout Jewish history, other than at the time of Purim. That was the only, other time, only time in history of the Jewish nation where all the Jews in the world were living under the dominion of one ruler. This is why we celebrate the holiday, since Haman had the ability to wipe out all the Jews in the world on one day. Another reason as to why God Almighty exiled us to the four corners of the earth was to spread not only monotheism, but also morality into the world. 
as it states in Isaiah, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and have taken hold of your hand and have set you up as a covenant for the people, as a light unto the nations. In addition, one of our missions in life is to retrieve the souls of all the converts that were destined to join the Jewish nation. There is a Zohar that states that when God Almighty created the world, he fashioned everything that would exist in the world at exactly the same moment. Then on each of the six days of creation, he placed everything in its proper place. Well, that being the case, all Jewish souls were created at the same exact moment of creation and then stored in a warehouse of sorts. There they were to wait until the time that they would be born. So on a soul level, we are all the same age. The Zohar states that after Adam, first man ate from the tree of knowledge, that Satan was allowed to enter this warehouse and to take out some Jewish souls and place them in the bodies of non-Jews. We read in the portion of in the Torah, the portion of Ayishla, chapter 34, that relates the story of Dina, the daughter of Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, our father, who was raped by Shechem, the prince of the city. The Orachayim HaKadr stated, based on a Kabbalistic meaning of the words, Betidbak nafsho bedina, that his soul clung to Dina, that there are times that a pure soul is closely attached to that of an impure soul. The pure soul lies dormant and is unable to exert any spiritually positive influence on that impure soul. This soul remains imprisoned, so to speak, until the time comes for it to be freed from the body of its host it can then fulfill, fulfill its mission in the body of a Jew. Reb Chanina bin Trajan said of himself, again one of the ten martyrs, that his soul inhabited the body of Shechem ben Hamor. Hamor. This is alluded to by the word Rechavat, which, spells out, which is spelled with a resh, a chet, a bet, and a tough, which is an acronym for his name, Reb Chanina ben Trajan. The Urachayim HaKadr stated that when Shechem kissed Dina, then the soul of Reb Hanina was able to attach itself to her. Through the kiss, she was able to release his, his holy soul from the body of Shechem. His soul was in a state of spiritual pollution, much like Anida, a woman who was in a state of spiritual impurity due to her menstrual cycle. The Hebrew words Dina and Nida, you can hear it, have the same letters. So the purpose of God Almighty exiling us to all four corners of the earth was so that we could attract those souls that were taken hostage by the Satan and return them back to Judaism. A magnet does not have the ability to attract anything unless it is in close proximity to another metal object. So too with these Jewish souls. The only way that we can exert any influence on these souls is by being in close contact with them. The Torah tells us that we should not proselytize. In fact, we try to convince would-be converts that they should not convert. We tell them they can earn their portion in the world to come as a righteous Gentile. There's really no necessity for them to convert. Still, there are those individuals who unknowingly have a dormant Jewish soul which is why they feel that they have no choice but to convert to Judaism. The key word that will introduce our redemption is yachad, which means gathered together in unity. Though the second temple was a time of great religiosity, it was also a time of sinas chinam, baseless hatred. What will usher in the era of the Messiah is when we can all come together in a state of total unity, not just in a physical sense, but also on a spiritual and ideological level. The prayer ends with the words, Blessed are you, Hashem, Bekabetz Nedeche Amo Yisrael, He who gathers in the dispersed of his people Israel. Now the Hebrew word Nidach means someone who is lost or cast away or abandoned. It also connects again to the Hebrew word Nida. The wording of this, of this ending informs us that in the time of the Messiah, even the most estranged Jew living in a state of spiritual impurity in the most remote area of the world will feel a true desire to return to their nation. Even those individuals who don't know that they are Jewish will also feel that burning desire to connect to their roots. 
Now, according to the Talmud and the Tractate of Sanhedrin, this return will even affect the ten lost tribes who seem to have somehow totally dis disappeared. Even they will once again be united together with the Jewish nation in the land of Israel. So let us hope and pray that we are, as the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Blessed Memory stated before his death, the last generation before the coming of the Messiah. As he stated, we just need to polish the buttons to merit ushering in a new dimension of time. So let us pray to God Almighty that he brings a quick and decisive end to the war in the Middle East. With the total defeat of Hamas, Hezbollah, and all the evil that exists in the world today, may he bring about the safe release of the hostages, cure all the sick and injured, comfort the mourners, and bring home all the brave IDF soldiers and, and victory, led by Mashiach Tzikainu quickly and in our time, and let it be now. Again, welcome back. Thank you for attending. I hope you've enjoyed the class, and I hope you continue to do so. Um, there will not be any music. Again, I'm not sure whether people enjoy it or not, so if you uh, do, please let me know, and we'll continue. And again, please make sure to subscribe, push the like button, and by all means, share with your friends. It's good to talk about Torah. We talk about enough nonsense in our lives. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Again, Shabbat Shalom.